Since the dawn of history, we have been at war. Not waged with weapons or force, but with lies. We have been deceived. The time has come to take back our minds. Resides a beautiful truth. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Good to have you today. Listen, now, uh, I'm very excited about baptisms uh, this afternoon, uh, and I know uh, Jake just got done talking about that. Man, I'll tell you what, that is such a cool time. Um, and, and there may be some of you here that, that maybe you've been thinking about baptism. Maybe you've taken that step of faith and you really understand that Christ died on a cross for your sin. And you have never, out of your, out of your own life, declared your uh, faith in Christ as your Savior and that demonstrated that through baptism. Let me encourage you. Today is going to be just an awesome time to do that. And, uh, and as we get, gather as community out there, man, we're going to cheer people on because this is really a defining moment for people in their faith journey. And, uh, man, to be able to be there and to applaud that and to celebrate that, man, that's just a great time. So uh, let me encourage you uh, to come on out there. By the way, you got to be careful when you park out there, too, because they do give tickets for double parking, and it does get crowded. Uh, so uh, when you get out there, get out there early if you can. And uh, uh, But we're going to have an absolute uh, blast out there. I want to take a moment, and I want to pray. Because I don't know what I'm going to say yet. So, uh, now, you know what? It, 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 but there's just a, a moment that I just want to take. Was, that, was worship awesome, by the way? Was that beautiful? And, you know, for, for uh, Hannah and uh, for Bill and for Lauren to lead us into that, that quiet place of rest. How many of you go, man, I just needed a place for my heart to rest today, right? Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Um, and that's the kind of space that God can really do amazing things through. And as we just gather before him and pray, that's, we just make room for him to do even more. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you have revealed yourself so passionately with a desire to, to forgive, a desire to adopt, a desire to bring people into your family as children. Lord, not to create a religion, but to create a relationship that would have been impossible for us on our own. And all that religion strives to accomplish, Lord, could not be accomplished in what you did by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And God, we thank you for that. And, and Lord, we want you to open up our hearts and our minds today. And Lord, we're just looking for what it is that you want to speak into our lives God, we thank you for all that come here, Lord, to just hear from you and to in some way take another step deeper, closer to you and uh, as you have taken giant steps towards us. Thank you so much, God, for all that you've done for us. Lord, we are humbled by your love, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, well... Um, uh, we've been doing a series called Propaganda. My name is Mark, for those of you that, uh, that don't know me, and uh, it's great to have you here. Um, we are doing this series called Propaganda, and we've been taking a look at you know, things that we tell ourselves, things that, that people will say. Sometimes they're Christian, sometimes they're non-Christian. Things that get repeated enough that it begins to sound like truth, but it's really not fully the truth. And one of the things that you discover about a lot of things in life is the things that we believe that, uh, that when, when you really discover who God is, there's something beautiful about him that seems to be the answer to everything that we believe. There's something beautiful, a beautiful truth about who God is, a beautiful attribute of who he is that is the answer to so many of the, the lies or the, the misconceptions that we have in our lives. And it becomes so freeing when you begin to see him for who he is. You know, God has such a deep passion to be known by you. 
God has such a deep passion for you to know him and to experience him. And this is a passion that has driven God for a long, long time. And this invitation that he gives to us to be able to experience him, to know him, to be able to hear him, to be able to follow him, to be able to experience something supernatural in our lives, to, to, to experience him filling up hollow and hurting and blank spaces in our souls are things that all he, he wants to do. And, and sometimes we don't realize it, but in our quest for these things, we're actually shortcutting the process, and we don't even realize it. And uh, years ago, when I was, uh, I was going to a support group um, that was a support group for wonderful people like me, um, in, in wonderful people like me in our marriage, um, I knew all the answers. I was wondering why my wife just didn't do what I was telling her to do, because if she did what I told her to do, she'd be happy like I am. I don't know why she didn't, wasn't getting it. You know, she just wasn't understanding, and I had all the answers, and I was wonderful. You could have asked anybody. They would have told you how wonderful I was. I was positive. I was upbeat. I had this great attitude. My problem was I confused um, who my wife's savior was. I was pretty sure it was me for a while. And so I would tell her, you know, the, do this and do that, and I don't know why you don't do this, and I don't know why you just don't listen to me. And, and it was hard to, for us to make any progress in our marriage because I was so bent on fixing our marriage. I was so bent on not fixing our marriage, I'm sorry, fixing my wife. And I didn't realize that there was something so broken about me that I felt the need to do that. And I thought that I was the one that God had appointed as the person to do that. And so they make support groups for people like that, by the way, wonderful people like me. Um, they're called codependency groups. Uh, if you're codependent, then the person you live with, um, you know, they've got their own issues. And you're sure that God brought you together so you could fix all of their issues. But you learn that it doesn't really work that way. And uh, so I was in this, this group for uh, wonderful people, and, um, and we're, we're sitting there, and, and you know, you're lear we're learning different things. And there was a, a certain part of the meeting where we would share, um, you know, a prayer request and kind of anything that was on our heart, just a kind of a way to be connected and, and to talk. And, and so different people are sharing about their, their situation, and yeah, I need prayer for this, you know, I'm finding that. You know, I just, I, I'm just always on my spouse about them doing this. Or, or I realize that I've been enabling my spouse to do this. Or I've been enabling my significant other to do that. And, and people are just kind of going around sharing. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I was a pretty new believer when this was all going on in my life. And everyone's sharing. And we get down to a lady, very young. She was about the same age I was, early 20s, mid-20s or something. And... And, um, and she said, yeah, I just want prayer, and yeah, I just want you guys to know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave my husband because I'm not happy. And I know that more than anything, God wants me to be happy. Now, when she said that, I thought, we get to do that? That's what God is like? Oh, this is awesome. And before that moment could really take, you know, traction in my brain, another thought came up that went, something doesn't sound right about this. Something about this is so broken, and yet the, the more I thought about it, the more I realized, ah, oh, how many times do I think like that? How many times do I get caught up in this thought that somehow I can allow myself to do things because I know that God wants me to be happy? And here's the problem. Does God want us to be happy or does he not want us to be happy? I mean, what do you think the answer is? You know, here's what I think the answer is. Yes, he wants you to be happy. I don't think there's any question he wants you to be happy. I think where I get confused personally is what the path to happiness looks like, right? The path, what I think is the way to get to happy, I think that's a very different path than sometimes the path that God is choosing for me. Sometimes the path that God is laying out before me is not a path that I like at all. And when I'm saying, God, I want to be happy, I know you want me to be happy, that there's an opportunity there for God to enter into that space in my brain and to kind of show me to how to get to his idea of what happiness really is. But it's hard. It's so hard for us to do that. When, when you look at the way that we are wired the way that we think and the way that we make decisions, what we don't realize is that we are actually creating a path. And it's a decision-making path. 
that every time we ask a question and we, we, we make a decision, that we are formulating a mindset that is actually setting up a pattern and a direction for our lives. We don't realize it. And this, this idea of God wanting to be happy, it is so, yes, true. But that's not the only thing that God wants for us. There's so much more. There's such a depth and a richness to what true happiness, lasting happiness looks like that we oftentimes don't have any concept of. And yet, it's the very place where God wants to lead you. Because it's a place that he knows where you're going to find strength. And he knows it's a place that when you get there, you're going to have peace. And that when you get there, you're going to say, there's something I've come to know about God and how to live that I did not know before I started asking this question. But there are several things, several points that I want to make for you as we kind of take a look at this issue. Here's the first one. The fact is, is we are not on a truth quest or a do the right thing quest. We are on a quest for happiness that's really human nature. By the way, this is not original to me, and I would, I would encourage you, if these things are speaking to you, dive into the suggested resources list at the end there because I can tell you something, there's so much to all of this stuff. But the fact is, is that, is that, is that we, we are on a quest for happiness. Now, is that always a bad thing? Absolutely not. That is not always a bad thing. That could be a great thing. The desire for happiness is the very thing that has led many of us here. The thing that brought us to, to open up our lives to a relationship with God and the understanding that he would, loves us is because we were, we, there were things that we were doing in our lives or patterns of the way that we were living and the way that we were thinking that brought us to a place of such emptiness, of such brokenness, where we realized, I'm not happy. And there's got to be something better than this. For some of you, it is this thing that has lived inside of you where you maybe have been raised in church, and though you've been turned off by so much of what you see, there still has been within you this place that goes, but there's still something about Jesus. And I may not connect to this church thing right now, but there's something about Jesus. There's got to be more to what it means to, to believe in Jesus than what I've experienced. There's got to be more to this thing than just going to church. There's got to be something deeper. There's got to be something real. There's got to be something that you can feel. And for you, that, that very sense of discontentment, that desire to be happy is the very thing that drove you to God. And that's not a bad thing. Matter of fact, baptism is so beautiful because it's, it's people who are saying, man, I'm, I so believe in God's forgiveness, in Jesus dying on a cross for me. I so believe that God wants to forgive me of sin and come into my life. I'm just dying to the old way that I used to live and try to make everything fit together. And I'm coming up out of the water to live a whole new life in a relationship with God. And for you, this, this quest for happiness has been a good thing. But the, the quest for happiness gets undermined for us sometimes. Back in the, in the, in the uh, uh, days of the prophets, the prophet Jeremiah was preaching to the kingdom of Judah. And he'd been warning them all along. He, he, he'd been saying, look, you, you guys, if, if you turn to idols and if you make alliances with other nations... You're going to end up on the losing end of things. I know, it, I know it sounds like a great idea for you to do these things, but, but there's something that God always wanted to demonstrate. What he always wanted to demonstrate was his power. He always wanted to demonstrate his faithfulness. He always wanted to demonstrate his love for the nation and for the people that lived in Judah. And, and he was always reaching out to them, always extending out to them an invitation to walk with him. In relationship. But like many of us, they went, well, God must want me to be happy. And it's hard to walk with the true and living God, isn't it? Because, man, he's got some standards and he's got some views on things. And it's so much easier if I can go ahead and get a hold of an idol. See, the cool thing about idols is this, is you get to shape them any way you want to. 
That's what's cool about making an idol. What's cool about an idol is, is you make an idol any way you want to, and you can, you can pray to that idol, and it will say whatever you put in your imagination that it's saying to you. And so you can do whatever you want if you've got an idol. I mean, who cares? I mean, the, the, you know, everything is wide open if you've got an idol, and so they turn to idols. And even as God was saying, look, if you, if you come to me, I will, I will defeat your enemies. They were going, oh, you know, we got to figure this out. we got to make this happen. And so they went to Egypt, and, and, and they said, hey, we'll, uh, we see you guys are strong. We'll be partners with you. And they make an allegiance, an alliance with Egypt. Later on, they see that, that Babylon is getting stronger. And they go, whoa, oh, <laughs> bad, our bad. Hey, Babylon, we're your friends, man. We're going to trust you. We're all in with you. And then later on, when Egypt started getting power, getting, well, our bad, Egypt, sorry about that. <laughs> we really, we believe in you guys. You guys are awesome. And by that time, God said, you know what, I'm going to take Babylon, and I'm going to take all of you into captivity for 70 years. And, and, and Jeremiah, this whole time, had been saying, guys, do you understand what's coming do you understand what God is offering you? Do you understand that he's extending his, his hands to you and he's saying, if you will turn to me, there are things, I will, I will grant you deliverance, I will grant you victory, but now I'm telling you, you better just sit tight because it's already going to happen. You're going to be carried off into captivity, stop fighting, just surrender, and go, and it's going to be easier for everybody. Well, they hated Jeremiah. They're like, somebody needs to shut him up because everything that they wanted to do jeremiah was telling them to do the opposite and so then they're just like so ticked off at him and and you look at this whole situation and sure enough they get carried off into captivity and god issues this statement his verdict upon the fact that he offers so much so great of an appeal that he makes and yet they turned from him. He says this in Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? He's saying everything seems so reasonable to you to do. Everything seemed like the right decision to make. You did what was going to make you happy. But you you misunderstood the fact that your own heart has a capacity to deceive you and you willingly will go along with it because in your quest for happiness, you put that above all else. But that's not the path that God had, not that path. And see, this is, this is where religion comes in. Religion will tell you if you do this and you do that, then everything is going to go well. And it totally removes that tension of living with God, living in a relationship with somebody. There's something beautiful about the simplicity of being in a relationship with God where he is offering to reveal himself. He's offering to show up. But what he's looking for is for us to look to him for it. Now, the people of Israel and our, and our is, issues are very similar. It's not that we're ignorant. It's not that we're misinformed. It's that our hearts are very cunning. So this whole idea of, hey, trust in your heart. You've heard me say stuff like that. Should you trust your heart? Should you? Should you follow your heart? Well, sometimes, yes. In Psalm 37.4, the scripture says this, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean he makes your wishes come true, it means he puts the desire in you to move you in the direction that he wants you to go. But there's that little part that comes before he gives you the desires of your heart that's so important. And it's delight yourself in him. What does that mean? To delight yourself in God means to worship him, not just sing songs to him, but to see him for who he is. To understand that he is the true and living God. To understand that he is for you, not against you. To understand that he is a perfect father. That he sometimes brings discipline into my life to teach me and to train me. That he is the God who knows everything. He already knows what's down the road already. And he wants to align me with his purposes so that I'm there to meet it. I'm positioned properly for the opportunities that he wants to bring me into. I delight in him because he is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my God. 
I delight in him because he is majestic. He is over the kingdoms of men. I delight in him because all of history is, is hurtling down a path of his plan. And I already know where it ends. It ends with him on the throne, ruling and reigning and bringing final peace to the world. I delight in who he is. See, but the people of Israel, they didn't delight in him. They knew he existed. They had God. And they had their idols. And they had their alliances and their plans, and they were all on the same level. They had all of them. They became religious. That's all they did. And yet God is calling us this place where, where we can really know him and where we can see him and we, follow, we can follow our hearts, but we never do it without realizing that in any situation with given enough pain, given enough stress, our hearts can lead us to make some really bad decisions. And it's not that I don't perceive reality. Here's our problem. What we do is we make up our mind ahead of time. I know it's going to make me happy already. I mean, you don't need to tell me. You don't need to ask me, why do you spend $650 a year on Starbucks? I've got reasons. I'm getting Starbucks no matter what. You can issue whatever health report you want. I'm going to drink it. Now, here's what I'll tell myself. You know why I drink Starbucks? My staff. I can't go to a meeting without having Starbucks, man. It's like a disaster. I, I do it for you guys. I don't dare stand up here and preach without having Starbucks first. If I stood up here without having Starbucks first, man, I would just be like in a coma the whole time I'm up here. But I get to be all jacked up because of Starbucks. I do it for you guys. You see, here's what we do. Here's what I do. I make up my mind what's going to make me happy, and then I give my brain the assignment to go find rational reasons to support what I've already decided I'm going to do. Am I the only one that does that? Or do you guys do it too? You know why I drink Starbucks? Makes me happy. <laughs> some people, yeah, it makes us happy too. Drink more of that, would you? <laughs> Help us out here, man. Give us some of that too, right? How many of you have cable? How many of you looked at your cable bill? How many of you, like, get shocked when you look at your cable bill? Why do you have cable? Why do we spend so much money on that stuff? Makes us happy. No, 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 because I need to stay up to date. I need the news. That's why. That's why I have cable. I absolutely need to know what the score is, and I need to be able to watch the game. It's important. It keeps me culturally relevant. And you can have conversations with your friends, right? No, you, you have cable, and you spend so much money on cable because it makes you happy. That's why you've got cable. Let me ask you a question. How many of you within the past six months have gone out to buy new clothes? Oh, yeah, liars. A room of liars. <laughs> I'll tell you what, just for my sake, lie for me. Raise your hand and say, yes, I did. Just, I feel so much more connected and relevant to you that way. Your pastor just told you all to lie. That's bad. So here's the deal. For any of you that have ever gone out to shop for clothes, there, I got you covered. How many of you could go to your closet and you still got clothes that have tags on them? Did you buy, why do we tell ourselves we need clothes? I need this, right? And I have a theory that if you need some, if you, if you want something bad enough and you want it long enough, it actually morphs into a need. Somewhere along the line, something magic happens there. It becomes a need. And we get it because we tell ourselves, I need this. And we'll give ourselves all the reasons why we need it. But we really got it. Because it makes us happy. That's why you did it. It makes us happy. How many of you got a new cell phone before your contract was up because they came out with a new model cell phone? Ooh, the, did you know the new iPhones are going to be coming out soon? <laughs> you know what that means? The iPhone you have is obsolete, going to be obsolete. That's bad. That's why you need a new phone, right? No, we do it because we're not on a truth quest. We're not on a I want to do the right thing quest. We're on a happiness quest. 
And our hearts will tell us all kinds of things. And, but we've already made our decision, and then we're telling our brain, be sure to come up with some reasons. Because when somebody asks me, I want to be able to tell them why I went ahead and did this. But I already decided I'm going to go ahead and do this. Because that's what makes me happy. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. When I use that as my guideline, God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? After all, God wants me to be happy, so I should be able to do this. Take a snapshot of your life. Boom, you make a decision right here. Take another snapshot. Boom, you use the same parameters. Take another snapshot. You use the same guidelines. Boom, here. And what's happened is you have created a movie now. And your life is a movie that is simply a progression of a series of decisions that you've made on the basis of, does it make me happy? Because after all, my God wants me to be happy more than anything else. And when we have put together a whole lifelong string of pictures, there's a movie that we create. Oftentimes, it's not a pretty movie. Because Jeremiah says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Here's the second thing that I want you to see about this issue of happiness. What makes you happy today is often the very thing that makes you unhappy tomorrow. The thing that makes you happy today is often the very thing that makes you unhappy tomorrow. The greatest regrets that you have today are the things that look like they were a great idea yesterday. Think about this. People get married and divorced for the exact same reason. He makes me happy. She makes me happy. They don't make me happy. This will make me happy. All the decisions that we make oftentimes are driven more by that than anything else. They become our biggest regrets. It's almost like this. If we were going to um, be like the nation of Judah and we were up here making our own idols, we would have a God called the Happy Now God. The Happy Now God talks to me. He's wonderful because he wants me to be happy. And the coolest thing is he wants me to be happy, not later, but now, right? And the Happy Now God, he will lie to me. He will tell me things but I know that more than anything, he wants me to be happy. And so when you look at the different areas of our lives, we'll see the happy now God crop up. Here's we we see him cropping up physically. Smoking, it was probably fun when you started. But man, you get to your 40s, you get to your 50s, smoking doesn't make you happy anymore. Now it scares you, right? Eating habits, dieting habits. You know, I, I, I love to eat these little pepitas, what do you call pumpkin seeds, right? Because they're healthy for you. But they're not necessarily healthy when I have 10 handfuls a night, right? <laughs> but I tell myself these are healthy. It's part of eating healthier. But the happy now, God tells me, oh, no, no, it's okay. 10 handfuls. Hey, it's like drinking skinny vanilla lattes. If you drink enough of them, you get skinny. It's why it says skinny vanilla latte. <laughs> Right? You eat enough of these things that are good for you. You just keep eating. You'll get healthier and healthier. You just got to eat tons of it. The things that we were so excited about at one point in our lives suddenly become the thing that makes us very unhappy later on. Vocationally, you enter into a vocation because it made you happy. It made you happy to work with kids or it made you happy to be in sales or it made you happy to lead an organization. And later on, you get to the point where you're like, I'm not happy anymore. Something happened along the line. And so then we make a decision. Well, what's going to make me happy? So then we choose to, to move on. Or, or, or as parents, we get angry at the teachers because it's your job to teach my kids. It's not my job. And I excuse myself from having to have any involvement in, my life, in the life of my children. And I blame it on the teacher. I was happy to send them to school. Now I'm unhappy that they're going to school. Financially, <laughs> well, this is where we all get in trouble. It gets real quiet in here when I talk about this stuff. Man, the car that made you happy when you bought it, and you bought it for all the right reasons, right? Because it has the latest safety features on it. Who doesn't want to be safe? It gets better gas mileage than the car that you had. Why would you not want that? It's so much better. 
And the, the very thing that made you happy when you first got it, now when you're dealing with the payments of it and you're trying to get out of debt, suddenly you're going, this doesn't make me happy anymore. But when you were thinking about it and, and, and people were giving you all kinds of advice, happy now God was telling you, absolutely, just do it. And, 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 and if somebody really reasonable came into your life and was saying, hey, you know, that's pretty expensive. That, you know, you might want to gear down a little bit, something that's a little bit more affordable. You, what you did was you ran out of rational reasons. You called the salesperson. Hey, I'm out of reasons. Tell me again what's so great about this car. You open up the brochure again. You read what's so great about the car. You get on the Internet. You read the reviews, and you go, it's a wonderful car. And you go, ah, happy now. Thank you. I really got it. And then it becomes your greatest regret later on. Isn't it funny when... When you make a purchase and they say cash or credit, right? Now, now it's like cash or debit a lot, but cash or credit. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be so much clearer if they said happy now or happy later, <laughs> right? Because happy now is, oh, yeah, do the credit thing. If you want to be happy later, it's no, save up and pay with cash. But if they put it that way, we'd all change our spending habits, right? Financially, some of those decisions that we make. When you go see a financial planner and, or you work out a budget and, 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 and you're, you're so bent on making that right, that's such an important place to begin to move to a place of happy tomorrow. Relationally is one of the big areas where we struggle in relationships with people, in relationships with God. Parents that, that are raising children and they, they want to be happy and so they want to be buddies with their kids. Because I just, I, just, I just like that buddy connection. And instead of being a parent, you're like trying to be their best friend. And you're almost like kind of making it so that you're equals and your peers, and, and it makes you really happy because you're getting your emotional needs met out of this relationship with this little person. And it makes you happy now. Then they become teenagers. And they see you as a peer, or maybe a little lower. And now it's very difficult to have the kind of parenting relationship that they need because Happy Now told you, be their buddy, and Happy Later is saying, this doesn't work. See, if Happy Now were telling you the truth, Happy Now would have said they need a parent. They don't need a buddy. And you need to help them to understand, and you need to help them to know how to maneuver through this world. I did not give you this child so that you could have a little friend to meet your needs. I entrusted this child to you because I needed you to lead them. But Happy Now doesn't tell us that. Happy Now says, oh, isn't it cute? Isn't it fun? And then when they kind of sass back like that, isn't it just cute to hear them talk like a grown-up, to repeat the things that they see on TV? This is so cute. Yeah, it might be cute now. It's not cute, so cute later on. It's difficult. Or, or, when you, or when you, Happy Now says, oh, yeah, well, go ahead and get into this relationship. Yeah, she comes by your cubicle all the time. You get a little excited when she comes by your cubicle. <laughs> Happy Now says, oh, I'm so glad she came and talked to me today. It's just exciting being with her. It's great. Your spouse is at home, and, but Happy Now is saying, hey, you be in the moment here. This person is wonderful, and you're happy now, and you begin to go down a path of what makes you happy, and hey, yeah, we'll go out to lunch together, and you go out to lunch together, and you begin to tell secrets about your marriage and your unhappiness, and Happy Now says, yeah, keep doing that. It makes you happy. It feels good, doesn't it? And Happy Now will lead you down a path that at the end you'll look at it and go, how in the world did I destroy my marriage? I never intended to do this. I didn't mean to do this. How did I get down here? Happy now. Spoke all the way through. Or, okay, I'm in this relationship, and, and, and you know, I know he doesn't treat me right. I know, I know that he, he's not, but I know he's going to change, and I know he cheated on her, but he won't cheat on me because I'm special. I know it. I'm just happy because I'm not alone. I'm happy now. And I know my friends say he's a bad person to be in a relationship with. I know everybody says he's no good for me, but I'm, but I'm happy because I'm not alone. 
And happy now will say, yes, yes. Be happy now. And then later on, when things really fall apart and the pain hits, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm so unhappy. How did we get there? Our heart told us, be happy now more than anything else. And it's so hard, isn't it? Because when we're in pain, when we're struggling, when we're dealing with loneliness, when we, sometimes you just feel like you need something good to happen in your life. Sometimes you just feel like I need a break. And, and, and any sign of relief seems like it had to have come from God. Because you've been praying, God, help me. It hurts. It's hard. And suddenly an opportunity presents itself. You're like, oh, thank you, God. This is the answer. This is it. This is what I've been looking for because it makes me so happy. And I know, I know that, that you know, he's not going to commit now, but that's all right. If we're together, if we're staying together, then, then he's going to commit to me one day, and I know it. And, and so, yes, I'm, I'm in with you. Let's move in. Let's, let's do all this stuff because I'm, I'm, I'm happy now because I'm not alone, and, 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 and I'm hoping that one day he's going to marry me, and that's great. And then years later, you get to the point where you realize that the one that you chose is not going to choose you. But happy now said, good idea. Do it. And now you find yourself unhappy later. And we follow these paths. And we, we think that we're in love oftentimes when what it is is we're just finding relief out of the pain of being alone. And God extending his arms, saying, would you let me guide you? The path to happiness is not the path that you think it is. Jesus, in even talking about a relationship with God, you know, he ran into this, this issue with people that were, that were saying, yeah, I want to follow you. Jesus, one, in one account, he fed 5,000 people, did a miracle, showed people, God will care for you. Showed people, I am God. I'm the son of God. I, I came to show you who he is. I just did this miracle for you. So you know the power of God. So you would open up your life to the power and the leading of God. This is why I've done these things. And later on, they, they, the crowds, they followed him. And Jesus turned to them in John chapter 6. And you know what he said? He said, you're not looking for me because of the miraculous signs. You're not looking for me because you saw my power. You're not looking for me because you're on a quest for truth or because you're on a quest to do what is right. You're following me because you ate. That's what he said. You're following me because it made you happy when you stuck bread in your mouth and you had as much as you could eat. But there's something so much more that he's offering than that. And the problem is, is, is when we choose to follow God because he's the God that makes me happy. You know, Jesus told the parable of, of people that receive the word of God. They receive the good news of God's love. They're like, woohoo, this is awesome. God loves me. This is great. And he says that when trouble or persecution comes, they fall away. Because I'm not happy right now. I wish I could tie in with that moment. But I can't. But we go, God, I'm not happy now. Life is hard. Life is difficult. I thought that when I was going to be yours, you were going to make everything great. I thought you were the God of happy now. And he says, because people will have a misconception of who he is, they will fall away when trouble comes. Let me tell you something. Baptism is about dying to all of that. Baptism is about dying to everything and saying, you are the true and living God. You are who you say you are, and I'm trusting you no matter what. And I'm dying to the person that I once was, and I'm alive because I want to walk with you. That's what baptism is about. It's not something that we tack onto our lives because it makes us happy. It's the death to that whole way of thinking and being and saying, I know this, 
that the only way to happiness is to follow you because my idea of happy and your idea of happy are two different things sometimes, God. But I know yours lasts longer than mine does. So when we sit there and you look in a drawer and you've got the budget, you've got the financial plan, and you shoved it away, and a lot of times it's not that you don't know how to get there. It's that you just don't believe that the consequences will ever catch up to you because somehow God has sprinkled something magical for you. And the fact is, is that for all of us, that where we end up in life is determined by the direction that our lives are going. And the direction of our lives are pieced together moment by moment, decision by decision. And, and, and it's, it's what do we understand that God is about that matters. Here's the third last thing to help us to wrap our minds around that. Is that the path to lasting happiness is found through honest self-examination with God's help. With God's help. Here's the problem. If I don't do this, if we don't do this, and we make decision on what makes me happy now, what does happy now say, what is happy now telling me, what happens is the thing that made me happy at one time is now the very thing that makes me unhappy. The farther you go down the path of life, the narrower your options become. The farther you go down that path, after you've made all the financial decisions, after you've made all the relational decisions, after you've made all the vocational decisions, after you've done all those things, you get down to the point where you don't have as many options anymore. They're just gone. Because you've narrowed yourself down into a place, you've put yourself into a category and in a place where suddenly you don't have the flexibility to do things. And so if you didn't save for retirement at 20 and you figured, I'll do it, you know, when I'm in my 30s because I want to be happy now and now in your 30s and you go, I, I'll do it when I'm in my 40s because I want to be happy now. I need the money now. And then you keep doing that. What happens is suddenly you find yourself 50 and 60 years old and you think about how in the world am I ever going to retire? I don't have any money. It happens because we listen to happy now. And so this is so important. Listen, guys, it could be there's a better way. It could be so much better. The path to lasting happiness is found through honest self-examination with God. And this can lead to great things. The pursuit of happiness can lead to great things. It doesn't have to lead to bad things. When we're willing to do it with God and we're willing to seek his counsel, when we're willing to open up our hearts to his leading, when when we're willing to open up the scriptures and learn his wisdom and walk in his ways, it leads us down a path to lasting happiness. When we're not hearing or we don't know when we seek the counsel of other people to say what is the wise thing to do in this situation and we begin to follow that in our pursuit of happiness we're able to land in some beautiful places. The fact is, is the husband who goes, you know something, this isn't working for me. This marriage isn't working for me. God, I need your help. What's the matter with me? What am I contributing to this marriage with? What what attitudes why do I keep doing the things I'm doing? Why, why could I be with somebody that I at one time loved so much and now I struggle so much to think well about them? God, what's happened in my heart? And when a man is able to do that, can I tell you, it's like, it's like putting clay on a potter's wheel and God goes, now you're exactly where I can do something with. Now I can lead you into lasting happiness. I can shape you. I can mold you. I can teach you how to love. I can teach you What's wrong with you? I can lead you to getting help to change those things. And God shapes you and he molds you. And by the time he's done, he's made a beautiful vessel that he can use. Some of the best things happen when we pursue happiness with God. When we pursue happiness with God and we say, God, my finances are a mess. Something has got to change. I would love to live a life of generosity. But I can't because my finances are so broken. And when you get counsel, when you do things like uh, I was broke, now I'm not, which is one of the ministries we do here with Bobby Cooper, when, when you enter into something like that and you put a plan together, suddenly your heart begins to be able to dream because you realize, hey, I'm actually having margin in my finances to be able to fund dreams and to be able to, to live a life of generosity. Something beautiful happens out of that. 
The most beautiful things happen in our lives when we allow happiness and the quest for it to be the thing that grabs our heart, but when we invite God into that. After telling us how sick our hearts are, the next verse in Jeremiah 17 is this, But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I know what's going on inside of you. That's what he's saying. I know what goes on in you. And so David wrote this. This is not new, but I really want you to hear this differently. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Say this out loud with me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's a different path. God, you lead me. You show me what's broken. I want happy now so much, but more than happy now, I want the happiness that only you can give. I want you to put me on the path that leads to everlasting life. And so here's what you do, guys. What do you do? you got to sit down with God. And when everything inside of you is saying full speed ahead, when everything inside of you says, but I deserve to be happy, I want to be happy, I've been waiting on God so long, and he doesn't fix it, that's when you've got to quiet your heart and you've got to sit down with him. And you've got to say, God, why am I doing this? Really, why am I doing this? And create a space where he can show you what's really driving you. When you invite him into that space, that takes courage, doesn't it? It takes courage to, to be able to, to go, the real reason that I lie about my family is this. The real reason that I filed for divorce is not all these things that I've been telling people. The real reason is this. The real reason that we moved in together was not because it makes economic sense, not because it's better to get to know somebody that way. It's the real reason is this. The real reason I won't call my kids is this. The real reason for all my credit card debt is this. The real reason I drink so much is not because of the people around me. It's because of this. The real reason I quit going to church is this. And to be able to say, God, Show me what's in my heart. Why am I doing this? Really? Man, that's just a great place. Just say that with me. Why am I doing this really? See, that's room for God to work. Here's the second thing. In light of the truth that God is showing me, what is the wise thing to do that I have been avoiding? What is the wise thing? You know what? It's usually the hard thing, isn't it? It's usually the one that you didn't want to do. But it's the one that you knew in your heart was the right thing to do. And to be able to do that is to have courage and to pursue him. Here's the deal, guys. God knows that the path to happiness, lasting happiness, is to learn to walk with him. That's what he knows. What he knows and what he believes is that you have the incredible capacity to experience him and to know him in ways that some people never, ever bother to because they're so busy on a quest for happiness that they never invite God to lead them into a place called joy, something deeper. They never let God lead them into a place of peace, and yet it's the very place that God wants to lead you. Hey, one thing I'd recommend to you, Jake Stevens preached a message last Sunday at Church of Motion about joy. It's on their website at Church of Motion. Man, it is so strong and so good. Let me encourage you to go check that out and let God take this deeper. But the question is simply this. Will you make room for God? In your quest for happiness, will you let him give you his idea of happiness? Will you let him do that? 
Will you be willing to, to stop long enough to pray and to say, God, why am I doing this really? And allow him to open up your heart to what it is that he sees. Everything that God wants to give you will come that way. And it won't come any other way than that through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, your passion, your determination for us to experience every good thing that you have in store. Your plans for us, God. But Father, we need your help. And though you've given us new hearts as, as we play, when we place our, our faith in Christ, Lord, we have to be honest that there's still that happy now thing in the back of us, part of the old us that still speaks. And God, it's only by your presence speaking to our hearts, speaking through wise people, speaking through your word that we can overcome that. Father, I pray right now for the, the young person, the single person who's, who's been going by happy now and they already feel that there's something wrong. And God, I just thank you that you love them and that you have a path for them. Would you just begin to unfold that? Would you give them the courage to see it? Father, for those that, that financially are in that place where <laughs> they just don't think that the consequences are going to catch up with them, and everything tells them, be happy now. But Lord, in the back of their minds, you've been speaking. Help them to hear you that voice, your voice so clearly, God. And Father, we pray that in all that we pursue, that as you look at the way we parent, as you look at the way we live as spouses, Lord, that you would put in us that heart, that determination to connect with your determination for us. To be able to know you and to experience you. To listen and then to see how when we choose your way, that it always leads to life. That it's hard, but it makes us so strong. And we walk and live with the knowledge of you that we would have missed out on. If all we did was keep doing what we always did. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for uh, just for listening on that. And let me encourage you, join us today. Remember, 5 o'clock is food. 6 o'clock are going to be baptisms. We're going to cheer people on who have just gone full on with their, with their lives for Christ. All right? God bless you guys. We'll see you.